what occasion the record was the 40th anniversary of a one my of a one man show I put together called Banjo Dancing or the 48th annual Squitters Mountain Song Dance Folklore Convention Banjo Contest and how I lost. And uh, in May 1979 uh, the show premiered in a little theater in Chicago and um, and it was a Cinderella story for me and, and it just life changed overnight. This really was something that could have only come from one person who had the, a particular uh, mental emotional construct that uh, that Stephen had that gave him all the gifts that were required to bring all of these elements together and to create something on stage that really was riveting and really was unforgettable. And uh, it's surprising that something that good went over, not only went over, but that endured as long as it did as a, a viable stage presentation. It's wonderful that he didn't get tired of it and uh, that was able to bring, you know, the sense of excitement and humor and, and his own personal pleasure to it night after night after night. But. Uh, that's what a gifted performer and a disciplined performer is able to do. And uh, I think uh, I think Stephen did that. It was a, a show where I largely uh, would do spoken word pieces accompanied by the instrument. Uh, I'd play at the same time and of course sometimes sing and sometimes dance. And on this record there are uh, a number of pieces like that, it's a long record. 65 minutes and um, and I try to explore some of those early early pieces that uh, sort of led to banjo dancing and uh, a couple of which uh, uh, actually appeared in 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 the show I played as my teacher's teacher his name was Doc Hopkins uh, Dr. Howard Hopkins. His, he was the seventh son in a family of 12 boys. And, and the seventh son in the Bible is the healer, and hence his first name really was Doctor. And Doc was from Eastern Kentucky, from Harlan County, and he came to Chicago in 1930 to sing on the National Barn Dance. Fleming Brown was quite a connoisseur of the music himself, and uh, knew and collected and could perform a great deal of it on his own and was an inspiration that uh, Stephen has talked about on many, many occasions. Fleming took lessons from uh, Doc Hopkins. Doc, when Fleming called Doc at the radio station to learn some banjo, Doc said, well, I can't teach you, but I can show you. And so, come around five, he said. And Fleming said, no, make, make it 5.30. I get off work at five. He said, no, 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 five. For five in the morning, that's when I do my wake-up show. Fleming's original inspiration to play, Hobart Smith came to Chicago to sing at the, perform at the uh, University of Chicago Folk Festival. And that's when he finally met him. And Fleming made the most extensive body of recordings Hobart ever done. And at one point during the taping, Fleming said, let's, let's put the banjos down and, and just talk. Let's talk about the music. And that's when Hobart says to him that how he'd be out working in the fields uh, in farming. And a tune would come into his mind, he said. He said, and I, he said I commenced listening to that. I whistle, I said, till my mouth got so tired. I go home, I go home pretty fast. I'd, I'd whistle all the way, he said, into the holler of the mountain. He said, my band should be hanging on the wall. I said, sometimes I forget where it's at. I whistled right loud, and he said, and the band should answer me, the sound, you know. And he said, pick up the band should, and he'd find that tune on the strings. He said, I never stopped, I never stopped till I found it, because I loved it, I loved it, he said. And I just went for it. Stephen Wade is probably one of the most sophisticated and complicated people that I know with a tremendous repertory of, of ideas and ways to approach music, ways to study it, ways to perform it, ways to talk about it, ways to uh, write about it. The banjo is a world of sound. Down low, it can bark. And up high, it can be like bells. Be strident and then whisper. Go from a harpsichord to a talking drum. Like a Model T Ford in a syncopated rhythm, it can be plaintive and mournful, and then explosively articulate. 
It's like watercolors full of happy accidents. It's asymmetrical and it's interesting to look at. It's hard to tune. It's recalcitrant. It's a musical mule. It has a voice. There are three historical or four historical recordings on this album, meaning that they were made long ago and well before all these other newer recordings. And and one of them includes Tom Paley. Tom was a real hero of mine and a great friend, a close friend. Another one that I really cherish, I knew what this record that this record had reached its critical mass is when I went in my closet and all of a sudden my eyes fell upon this recording. It was Doc Hopkins and myself on The Voice of America in 1982. Doc had come to Washington to play at the National Folk Festival. Stephen uh, likes to incorporate uh, friends and colleagues and things, and so uh, instead of just banjo or banjo and voice, there's extra people that are brought in to do instrumentals with him and, and to back him up on songs on various tracks too. There really are some wonderful aggregate of musicians on this record. Uh, Brandon Ernst is playing the pump organ on a cowboy song. Uh, Joel Bales is playing piano on a gospel number. Sam McLeod is playing guitar uh, behind a mountain banjo ballad. And he also plays a washboard on a jug band song we do in uh, company with Marv Wrights, playing that jug, occupying that bass frequency. And we have bass itself of Alex Lachemont playing both a, a bowed bass and plucked bass on a couple different songs. And then those historical recordings with Tom Paley plays the fiddle on one number and Doc Hopkins is singing and playing the guitar as we play together and Tom Minty uh, plays the mandolin. We do a duet right at, right at the end of this, this record. It's a heartfelt record uh, marking 40 years of, of banjo dancing and I'm grateful to them all. <laughs>